Good morning. Welcome to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to lands, water, sky and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Today, we'll be hearing from Dr. Yusin Le Cooper. He'll be speaking about the world's largest airborne electromagnetic survey. Dr. Le Cooper is a senior research scientist with the Geophysical, Geophysical Acquisition Section in the Mineral Systems Branch at Geoscience Australia. Yusin leads the world's largest program of airborne electromagnetic data acquisition, known as AUSAEM. He interprets and inter integrates geophysical surveys with geological data to predict subsurface structures and physical properties of underlying materials. Throughout his career, Yusin has collaborated with colleagues from various research organisations and industry sectors around the world. His work spans applications in mineral exploration, groundwater studies and environmental assessments. Notably, he has also contributed to the use of geophysics in archaeological and humanitarian contexts. Houston's work plays a crucial role in shaping the future development and preservation of Australia's resources and natural heritage. Please welcome Houston to the podium. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Marina, and thank you everyone here and whoever's online. So with further ado, I first would like to make a brief acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the custodians of the country throughout Australia and acknowledge their continuing connection to land, water and air. At GA, we acknowledge the First Nations as the original mappers and navigators of the waterways and lands we stand on. We pay our respects to their people, their cultures and their elders. In particular, I would like to acknowledge and thank the communities of the lands we have flown over with the OSAM program. So, Behind an acquisition program of this size, there's a lot of different work that goes on and of different nature. So I would also want to acknowledge the <coughs> colleagues and people that take care of securing the funds, the management, the contracts, stakeholder engagement, the technical experts. So anyone who I haven't mentioned um, but can feel alluded, I would like to thank you. Um, a little bit of history. Uh, James, a few months ago, shared with us an old document that gives us an insight to history of our agency, GA. And I think it's in moments like now, when we are thinking the direction we are going as an agency, that we reflect on where we have come from. Um, so I would like I encourage people who haven't read this document uh, to have a look. It's a, quite a fascinating read. So what I've done is, of course, I've just highlighted the things that show how good um, and important geophysics is. Right. <laughs> so back um, back in during the war um, between nineteenth. Between 1936 and 45, during the Second World War, the Mineral Resource Survey was established, right? Another thing that I highlighted there was, um, yeah, back then already we had a stoic geophysical section, which is the one we I work in now. Um, so then, yes. Towards um, 1946, the Public Service Board approved a permanent organization um, and the name changed to the Bureau of Geology, Geophysics and Mineral Resource. That's when it was formed. The geophysical section included, uh, the geophysical and geology section included 17 geologists and 24 geophysicists, so professional officers they were called. Um, I think we're about the same number now that <laughs> we are between OSMT and CAP. Uh, yes, what else did I highlight there? Sort of some other interesting things like when um, the 
observatories like the Waterloo and the Tulinga that are in Victoria were kind of handed over to the Commonwealth. Um, yes, a few little other things there. What I also kind of found that was interesting, it was I found the first airborne um, survey was flown for the agency. Um, and that was with a scintillometer in the rum jungle. So it's kind of the basic principle of using the radiometrics. And um, that was kind of one of the first records of doing airborne geophysics in the agency back in 1952. So we've got a record and just so you can have a, you can find it as an ECAT record. And so you can get a little flavor of um, the kind of annotations. There was, of course, prior to GPS, so a lot of handmade notes. Really nice piece of work, I think. Um, okay, so an agency like GA um, has to develop consistent widespread geo geoscientific data sets, right? When we are exploring in such an old continent like Australia, where most of the rocks and land formations have been exposed to some sort of weather or erosion, around 80% of the geology is under some sort of cover. And that's why geophysics is so important. Mapping just restricted to where the fresh rocks are and where the drill holes are available is really of limited utility, right? So one of the roles of GA as a national geoscience agency is to develop these consistent Australia-wide data coverages. These coverages should be um, res resource agnostic, so we don't tailor our surveys for one specific resource. Um, the coverage, yeah, and, and as we have seen, the, they're, they're used widely for mineral, energy, groundwater resources, but also in assisting in the managing of environment and conservation purposes and many other applications that always arise. We see our, pre, uh, our pre-competitive data sets as um, an infrastructure for innovation, for discovery and for research. They really are a public good. So what I'm showing you here are some of um, what we call maybe, or some of us call the, the crown jewels of GA. Um, there are very few projects in Australia which haven't used or made use of some of these four data sets. Um, as you can see, we have the seamless map of geology that has been informed in great deal by the geophysics. We have the radiometrics, the magnetics, and the gravity. So the magnetics and the gravity have been crucial in base metal discoveries. They also have been used to delineate um, basins for energy and groundwater for structural mapping, faults and folds, and seamless um, mapping of geology across the different jurisdictions which is something that um, is of crucial importance. The leveling and consistency of these um, data sets is of particularly importance. Um, if we didn't do this leveling, what you would see is an ad hoc patchwork of surveys that wouldn't produce these beautiful images. For, for instance, the radiometrics is becoming of uh, particular importance in recent times because it has the potential to underpin the boom in rare earth elements and lithium exploration. It's kind of, we still have these hidden gems that to some extent are underutilized or can be, continue to be utilized in the future. Um, some of our science drivers, as we know, have been to stimulate exploration. So open new provinces for, mineral, for minerals. Um, secure water resources. So these data sets are critical for groundwater management. We also use this for planning infrastructure, finding potential hazards, saltwater intrusions, where things um, can be 
bogged or other other sort of infrastructure that can be used um, in Australia for hazard monitoring and also um, as I said previously sustainability and conservation to enhance our energy supply. So um, the AEM has been fundamental to this to the risk for the de-risking of um, areas in zones that private industry would not even um, attempt to explore. So this image, just as, as a fact, um, is composed of 6,700 flight lines, and it's close to half a million line kilometers. These are 20 Ks. Nowhere else in the world has the data sets that we have, um, and that is something that we should be very proud of at GA. So this talk, Marina asked me to give <laughs> in the back of uh, on a, um, we had a, a, an Airborne EM conference, an international Airborne EM conference in Australia. So we had a lot of international visitors. And of course, uh, with a bit of cheek, I, um, I like to show some of our uh, icon um, mammals. So they're mammals, but they're monotremes. So they actually also lay eggs, which is something very unique. And I do think as humans, we learn by understanding our environment, right? And observing the live, living creatures and how they interact with the surrounds. So we talk a little bit about these biotic um, interactions. Um, to some extent, we as humans emulate um, these, these ways of sensing that these animals have naturally. There are other animals that use electrosensory techniques, both actively and some more passively. But because we're in Australia, we'll just talk about the monotremes, OK? <laughs> so what they do is they use this electroreception to find their prey and to navigate. Um, so live prey produces electric impulses, and that's picked up by their nervous system. It's amazing. I'll show you a little bit how um, these receptors are located in rows in the skin or in the beaks, in the, in the case of the echidna and the platypus, in their bills. So they are um, constitutive of these sensitive mucus glands, glands and they can determine the, the direction of the electric source. It's quite amazing, really. Um, so you can see the platypus has over 30 of 40,000 transmitter receivers, and uh, the kidneys, either the long beak or, or the short beak, has 2,400. So that's just an introduction. But I think we could claim in that some of the very first EM actually happened in this continent. So, <laughs> right? Good. Um, OK, so again, a little bit of history. How um, AEMs. The, the surveys evolved from the 90s. We originally did a little bit of trials around dryland salinity, mostly for waterways. But that gained experience um, allowed us to embark a, a national wide acquisition program. And this is where we are today. You, you saw that transition. Um, just in, in a nutshell, I'd like to, for people who are probably less familiar, how does AM work? So we have a transmitter that is wrapped around the wings of the aircraft there. That produces um, an electric pulse that migrates through the ground and interacts with, um, with the ground that in turn produce eddy currents that you can see here. Um, and then those are picked by, by the receiver, which is behind. Knowing how this these things interact, the geometry and how these moving bits um, and the different pulses that the, that the different um, contractors pulse the ground with is of crucial importance when we're doing the modeling because we're actually just measuring volts, right? What we are trying to get is a model of conductivity and depth. So that kind of is of crucial importance. I will just show a really quick overview of electrical properties of the earth materials to give you a, an idea of the color maps we will be using in this presentation. 
you people who at GA would be probably very familiar with these reds and blues, but what do they mean? Um, so firstly, let's look at the rocks on your left, right? So you can see igneous and metamorphic rocks are usually warm colors, so they're the blues. They're, um, they're electrically resistive or less conductive. They have low conductivity. Then the sandstones will be resistive to moderately conductive. That's why we're going to the blues and greens. Um, the mudstones will be a little bit higher conductivity and we're going into the warmer colors. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we would have the massive sulfides, right? And that's where we get all of our, lots of our base metals from. Um, some of these materials have a range that goes from several orders of magnitude, as you can say. So you cannot take a measurement and say, well, this is a massive sulfide, or this is a clay, or this is salt water. The context is important. Electrical conductivity is also influenced by weathering. Um, by the porosity and the fresh water of brines or fresh water, right? So mostly fresh water is in the resistive side. So blues and conductives are red. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think, okay. Now let's have a little look at the example on the bottom right there. You can see a conductive zone that is so red overlain by a more resistive zone. Um, that's coming through. And then again, by another more conductive zone. Um, we, can in, we can interpret this when we associate um, lithologies that we can get, say, from bores. And that enables us to do a more realistic interpretation using the different elements that we have at hand. So that's kind of the train of thought that interpreters would go through. Yeah, there you go, the lithology. Okay, just a really quick um, run through the history and the evolution of the big program. It started back in Queensland, 2017. Um, and as I said, just walking on the experience that GA had gained from the magnetics, the gravity and previous um, large scale AEM, uh, we kind of got the courage and um, the expertise were in place to, 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 to embark on such a titanic task. Um, so this is how, I guess, the origin or the, or the very first stage um, of the OSAEM Continental Wide uh, Electromagnetic Survey. It was obviously, um, it's a product of a collaboration with our state and, and territory partners who have played a crucial role in the acquisition and some of the funding, et cetera, right? Um, so then the program expanded. We moved into the Northern Territory and you can see the change of, light direction, of flight directions. We went from East-West to North-South and that was trying to um, intersect the geology perpendicularly, which is what um, kind of the ideal situation to do some mapping. What happened then is we extended from the NT to WA, noting again the importance of mapping across borders, gradually um, extending the coverage and moving into some very remote areas where the planning and the logistics were truly tested. We've, with some of these areas are extremely remote, like um, hardly anywhere else in, in the globe, actually. So then you can see we extended, we got a little bit further coverage. Then a seamless image began to unveil, right? Um, we thankfully, or as a consequence, have been um, developing our own inversion and modeling codes. And that has meant we can independently assess the data. So here, um, the image I'm showing two different platforms, two different instrumentation, it's a helicopter, and a plane. So despite they are both measuring electromagnetic fields, um, the nature of the acquisition is quite different. But some are higher, some, some travel lower uh, base frequencies at which they transmit. But having that capability at GA allowed us to make a real 
um, assessment of what we were getting and what we were modeling, right? So, as you remember, the, the, the theme of this title was reconciling um, different things. So here we are, this is a measurement of reconciling the response from different, different instrumentations. Then we moved um, to Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. This was over denser, more populated areas. And um, this also had its logistical challenges, mostly around community engagement. We have a very good group of people um, and uh, an officer that works in the team that has been instrumental for this and that meant we had we could send tens of thousands of no of notices to the community. Hundreds of local governments have been notified and native title and Aboriginal land councils, many grazers, public schools, police stations, libraries, of course the pubs, and um, several newspapers and radio stations. So that's kind of the scale you have to take into account when you're doing these kind of surveys. Um, six, later, and six years later, we came back to WA and NT, and still we got the seamless image. And that was um, despite being acquired at the very different periods of time. So that brought the regional coverage to approximately 100% of WA. We're around 65% of um, coverage at this stage. So this is just uh, a little fluky image of how the OZM would look if we saw it from outer space. I thought that's um, kind of cute. So just a little bit about the importance and the inversion tools, because we have developed these tools and those consume a lot of our, of our time and, and sort of the expertise and probably there are things that aren't kind of shown, that they don't shine as much as the pretty pictures, but they're of crucial importance. And I hope I have been able to convey that um, AM systems are really then spoke. They're not kind of off the shelf, right? So we need to understand these idiosyncrasies of, of all of the systems that we're using. They're constantly evolving. The electronics keeps changing. They're kind of getting <coughs> different um, materials that, that are used. So, and a lot of, there's a lot of ancillary instruments. Now we're kind of using gravimeters and other things on at simultaneously. Um, so the operation is under a very uh, difficult circumstances. You get one pass, right? The plane is not going to fly again. It's dynamic. So there's a lot of turbulence. We cannot calibrate these things in a in a lab, and this 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 goes somewhere. There is a reason why I'm telling you this. And then the time con um, the quality control is very consuming. It's not a push a push button analysis. These peculiarities have meant that we've de developed these in house codes, and we have designed them to deal with real world acquisition difficulties. And at the scale that I've shown you. There are a lot of commercial codes that cannot handle the, the, the size of, um, of, of the data sets we're dealing with. So that has meant uh, when we are developing these codes, we have to consider the parallelization using the NCI, which for people who are not aware, stands for the National Computational Infrastructure, is one of the biggest computes in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. That's, that's where we're playing. That's our playground every day. Um, and it's great because they are free, right? So there are two main codes. We have the high QGA that deals with probabilistic and deterministic inversions. And I'll tell you what that is just briefly, just a quick rundown. And also an old working course that is really robust and widely used, the GAEM, which we have just done the latest release a few weeks ago. It, hasn't, it hadn't been updated since 2016, so 2024 is our latest release. And we've fixed a whole bunch of things and incorporated more systems. So anyone out there who would like to, to try and model some AM, you're very welcome to download them from GitHub and talk to the team. So now a little bit more about um, AM code development and modeling. Again, 
where is a constant reconciliation between measured and a response and a proposed model, all right? So what you're seeing here is um, the measured data, which is between the error bars and a model. On the left, you're seeing several iterations. So you can see how the conductivity is varying with depth. And those error bars is what we allow um, the measurements to move from or around, let's say. So why are there two curves? Because if you remember in the sensor, we have an X and a Z component. Those are the sensors, how we're measuring the electric field, which is like that. So those are two pieces of data that we're getting um, and that's what we're recovering, right? So in this example, at the end, you can see there in the blue, oh, yes, is a downhole conductivity. Oh, apologies, I'll go back. So that's a downhole conductivity. That means um, someone has put a probe down on the ground and tried to measure the conductivity. And that will be important, and I'll go again to say why in a few minutes. So, as I said, one of the other codes that have been developed are Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. And these are a class of algorithm that samples the probability distribution. There is a burn-in period, which means um, it kind of iterates to try and fit the data. And you can see that up there, so it's a burst bur uh, burn-in sample. So what actually we're doing is not conforming to one best fitting model. We're sampling a huge array of data sets, hundreds of thousands, and all of those um, are fitting the data within the limits. So it's a really robust way of kind of trying to test things to the extreme. That's how we kind of see them. Um, the warmer colors here and the narrower the distribution, the more confidence we have on the features, right? And um, so that's the final ensemble of a sounding. As I said, um, we, it represents hundreds of thousands of models. And let's say the two extremes are what we call the 10th and the 90th percentile. They're the extremes, the most resistive and the most conductive models that honor the data, right? And then again, we have the downhole conductivity from the Menindi Lakes um, test range. And I'm gonna talk about that. So, in New South Wales and in Australia, we have one of the only test, AEM test ranges in the world. It has been flown over a period of 15 years, and AEM contractors, in order to be awarded contracts to fly a survey for the Commonwealth of Australia, need to demonstrate that they can map known features. That's the Manindi Lakes. Um, so the specs are a little bit like that. There's two lines, what we call the south, the north line and the south line, and those black dots are downhole conductivity. So it's a way of kind of ground truthing um, our inversions or our, our measured conductivities derived from the AEM. Okay, so have that in mind. What I'm gonna show you is now a few examples of, of the modeling around that. So, here is just a section of the northern line. Um, and what I've just plotted is the depth uh, at which the deeper holes are, which is around 100 meters. Yes, there. And that is where you would, and most typically, try to draw a line of conductivity or interpolate your geology from bores. That's what, that's what we standard do, right? Um, so that's the northern line. This next image is an image of conductivity, and it's a mix between um, our deterministic, that's the stochastic, the, the, the three, the three on, panels on the top, and the deterministic inversions. They're subtly different. Um, there are things of importance, but I think what I would like to see is with different platforms, we are mostly recovering very similar Earths, and that's how it should be, right? That's the importance. So we are kind of um, staying away from the marketing and other things that sometimes we're exposed with, with vendors. So we do the curation and the QC in-house, and that's kind of, I think, what's put us apart. So just 
as a little disclosure, any of the trade product names uh, that I use in this, if I use any, or if you can read some, because I won't mention them, are for, uh, for descriptive purposes. That doesn't mean GA endorses a, a particular system over another, which is important. So, um, and again, so we're using different inversions and also different platforms. So again, here comes the concept of reconciliation. We're trying to use different inversions and different platforms and just it's kind of a little bit of assurance of Jesus. I think we're doing things okay, right? Um, so this is a very interesting image. Um, it's kind of hard to believe, you would probably say, but the conductivities in the bores have been color-coded with the same um, color bar that, that the sections. And of course, they were taken at different times, different period, and the match is incredible gives us great confidence that if we know the modeling and what the noise levels, a whole bunch of things, we have a very good handle to try and interpolate between the bores. So, so that is quite comforting for us, right? So again, we're trying to reconcile the downhole measured and the airborne models. Okay, so this is another <laughs> interesting images. They, they might look the same, but they're not. These are different systems. And that's the 10th uh, percentile, so the most resistive. And so this image is composed of hundreds of thousands of images again. Um, sorry, not images, models, individual models. So those are helicopters, those are fixed wing, and those are helicopters. And really, it's very hard to, to see the difference, especially if you think about these acquired over periods of 15 years difference. Right, and then that's a median model, which is also again sampling that curve that I showed you right in the middle. Um, the it's matching the conductivity really well, and that's the extreme, the the what we call the most conductive extremes. All right, now relax, and I'm just show you going to show you a few little pretty pictures of some of the applications of AEM and some nice geology and photos. So this is a Kimberley. Um, it's one of our surveys and it's fantastic geology. And it was, uh, yeah, Jesus, uh, we, we, the, the team, we've, we've, we, it gave us a lot of headaches. It's a very resistive environment. We usually talk about using AEM to sample down to 300 meters. There's areas here where we can see up to 600 meters. Right, um, we have quite confidence that because of such a resistive environment, and just uh, have a look, please, at the section below. So that's right up there where that red line is on the left. And sorry for people online, that's where this line comes from. Um, and we have a vertical exaggeration of times twelve. So of course, the, the this looks at probably not very realistic, but the conductive features that are um, being seen and mapped here are, I think, quite astonishing. And of course, that's a photo of what the pilot was looking at while she was acquiring. Um, this is our typical uh, multi-plot that we call. So these blue spikes is kind of a um, parameter we use to determine how well or bad our feet is so high high level so those spikes is where we're really not honoring our our data with a proper model so those are areas where we would have um, doubts to interpret but i think overall that was a fantastic um, data set that came um, now going to the other side of the country though the um, in New South Wales, uh, the worm mongols, and this is an example of our latest data set. We just released it two weeks ago. Uh, it was a, a acquisition that we did in conjunction with the, the, the Jill survey of New South Wales. And it's a really nice example because we were looking for groundwater in the worm mongols National Park. Some of you guys might have camped there. It's a really nice place. But with that as an excuse, let's say, um, we... We, that enabled us to understand and gain, gain some insights of, an arc, of the architecture of an old volcano. So I'll, I'll try and show that. 
So around 17 million years ago, there was a hot spot which formed, formed this, um, this, vol uh, product, this product of this volcanism, um, the warm bungles kind of saw the light. Then 30 million years ago, a large shielded volcano formed. It was about 50 k's across. Yeah? Over time, erosion has carved away the weathered volcano and reveals a um, series of really spectacular landforms. So similar to what you can see there now. So this is a, a, um, an image. This is of, of a satellite image in 3D of the Warren Bungles. And that's the data set we released. So you can see these black lines are a little inset of the regional scale AM that we usually do. And what I'll just do is try and show you how you can navigate through AEM data to explore things from different perspective and understand the, the plumbing or the architecture of these things like volcanoes. So there you go, we're rotating it, it's coming up. Then we change the vertical exaggeration. This was done all in EarthSight, which is um, one of the tools we use for visualize our, our sections and other data in 3D. Um, so you can see that. Then I'm taking a few lines out. You can see some interesting layers in. I'll rotate it again. You can see some conductive structures coming out and a bit more, rotating it more. And that brings me to the next example. One of the things we have done is we have also reprocessed and reinterpreted um, a lot of the legacy data. A lot of airborne EM data is acquired in Australia, like huge amounts, especially by the mineral in uh, by by the mineral sector. But a lot of those data sets, after five years, they they're surrendered to the states and they are publicly available. So what I'm showing you here is an example of 36,000 line kilometers of data acquired in in the Musgraves, which is an extremely remote area. Um, and they were acquired between 2009 and 2012. So uh, the GAP team, the Geophysical Acquisition team, and the Groundwater team reprocessed these legacies, and we created a seamless map of paleo channels. So it's a great example also about reconciliation between legacy data and current data, but also a way of leveraging um, industry funds, you could say, with government funds, right? So just a brief example, what I'm showing you here is two, two images, two sections, let's say, and um, you can see they look pretty similar. They were, of course, acquired at different times, and it's a coincident line, so we have confidence. It's a way also of calibrating, you could say, or, or assuring that some of that industry data is up to scratch or at the standards that are usable for GA. Okay, I'm coming to the end and, uh, and, and um, what I'm trying to do now is I'll show you some of the applications of AEM that we really didn't have in mind. But one which is uh, exciting and of interest is um, for storage of hydrogen. So applying it for, 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 yeah, for hosting hydrogen. So, the, a the OZM has confirmed the existence of previous known salt diapyric structures, but it also has revealed potential new ones. And all these are being analyzed for hydro hydrogen storage potential. The salt diapyrs show in the, uh, in the AEM profiles, as you can see, as prominent anomalous um, structures that are being disrupted by the continuous background. The AAM um, shows that moderately conductive material has been disrupted and salt moved the flanks onto the diapir. Why is hot hydrogen salt storage um, important? Because it improves um, it, it, yeah, it, it involves producing artificial caverns in a naturally occurring geological setting, so these salt di diapirs. 
Um, underground storage is safe and cheap alternative for large scale hydrogen storage compares to other fo uh, forms such as liquid ammonia or liquid hydrogen or even equivalent of battery so storage. So on that example, I'm showing you um, another line from the, what, which is called in the officer basin, the vulnerable assault die up here. So again, the AM shows a salt moderately conductive material and how it's been disrupted by the flanks of the diapir. This um, was confirmed with some downhole conductivity in a, in a report produ uh, produced by Alex Shan, our colleague from Western Australia, that's also been important. Kind of changing gears just very quickly Revealing the geological details in less explored environments is also important. Um, we were talking about this um, many times. I have get I get asked, okay, this is the biggest survey. You're collecting more data, and for what? So I think this is a good example why collecting geophysical data and applying new approaches has um, can reveal details of geological environments in less explored um, environments, and this is crucial. The, this case confirms the existence of critical minerals. So the OZAM program, this, this area, was flown in conjunction with a dual survey of WA, and it has been proven um, to be helpful at different stages of the critical minerals search in Australia. Uh, all the way from project generation to area selection and targeting and drilling. So here, north of Esperance, um, a company called OD6 picked two of our lines uh, for a proof of concept. As a result, they then further engaged with the CSIRO and other consultants to acquire another 11,000 of uh, line kilometers and now are um, sort of testing and trying to extract rare earths from, from, these, from these lines. And I'll try to show you what I've, they, they kindly explained to us what the process is. So the AM was used for identification. Um, they're trying to find uh, granites that are rich in rare earth elements. And these have progressively we been weathered into clays and transported, right? through a whole bunch of processes, either groundwater or chemical weathering. And then they are deposited in, in, in sedimentary basins. So you can see, um, okay, so the AM data corresponds well with the thickened clays around 20 and 50 meters below the surface. What I'm gonna show you now is the, years, the yellow circle and the red lines here mark the top and bottom of the prospective um, clay horizon. So that's how it was used for targeting, right? Um, then the conductivity depth models that, that were derived from GA's data are constantly being used by, by industry and other governments to progress their exploration. Um, in this example, as I, as, I, as I said, the host was uh, pegmatites and the rare earths, which are uh, a byproduct, are resulting in element bearing clays. So, again, just to target whether granite um, clays, they have a, a, an important signature. And more importantly, they have already done some drilling. And this has, the, the report is that they have found zones between five and eight meter, um, meters thick, which are kind of enriched with these claims, which is important. Okay, now the last part of the talk. So if you machine learn, if you use artificial intelligence to try and predict conductivities between, uh, this is what you will get. It's a pretty image, I mean, really, right? But it's very far from reality, okay? So you can, of course, refine your, your algorithm and say, okay, 
now use Australia wide airborne electromagnetic map and generate an image and you get this pretty image or another version of it or even another version of it. Okay. <laughs> so lastly, um, you can then modify again your, your, your commands for generation um, and say, okay, specifically use the OSAM data and that's what you're getting. That's a very interesting one. I like this one. Um, and even uh, as a local joke, you, I went all the way and said, okay, do the same. Electrical conductivity of Australia, continental derived from airborne electromagnetic, but use a turbo color bar. So for, for some people here will, be, will know the importance of the turbo and the jet color bar, and that's what you get. Still, we're far. We're trying, but it's, it's really not there. So what, what uh, why did I use this as a preamble? It's because um, one of the things we have been sort of looking into is using uh, machine learning or sort of smart algorithms to use covariates to predict the um, conductivities between our lines. If you can see our lines in this image below on the left, our 20k spacing and there's a lot of if you try to do a normal little creaking or grid um, you will get kind of very coarse not smooth images so one of the things we have done is use other data sets and we're refining this as a constant evolution to then generate a conductivity of the layer of the very surface of of the australian continent that's the very top zero to four meters. Um, so a little bit of ground truthing here or, or zooming into some examples, we'll, we'll that, that figure seven, which is that little box. I'll just zoom in and show you an example of uh, the two products of so just using a normal interpolation and using smarter ways to do the interpolation. And that's kind of the result. That's the top, just standard interpolation. And that's kind of using other features like um, elevation and other features that are of importance. And that finally shows this majestic image of conductivity, which as uh, you can see in the inset is kind of a product of these sections, of course. And the reason why this looks red but it's actually blue because if you zoom into those sections the first four meters of those sections are the nullable planes which is really a resistive environment right it's a karst environment so it's done a good job in some places it has failed abysmally and we have we're working on it but it's just kind of a nice image and, and, and sort of useful for some things um just to wrap it up, uh, and I think I've got a few more minutes. Is that okay, Marina? So what, what have we done? It, GA has been doing continental coverage for a long time. Um, we're the only country in the world, and I will reiter reiterate that, that has the geophysical coverage that we have. And that's something to be proud of for people who work here, but for people who might not and need access, the data is free. So it's an important legacy for generations to come. Um, we're constantly trying to work, and I hope I showed you this through, through the presentation of introducing new inversion algorithms, trying to get the most that we can from our data. And the byproduct is uh, inversion codes that are being used all over the world. It's, it's, it's really amazing. Um, we make a big effort to maintain the technical specifications and our test range has been an important part of that. As I hopefully showed you, AM is resource agnostic. And so that means a lot of the applications are there, but there are many to come that we have no idea. Um, so there's some really nice examples or for instance uh, monitoring saltwater intrusion so used for hazard and hazard monitoring and and other sorts of applications 
sustainability and conservation. It's really interesting um, that the Department of Water Resource Basin Characterization in California is now kind of following our lead and flying a statewide AEM project for understanding their groundwater and, their con and, con and the preservation of their ecosystem. So it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to see that we're kind of leading the way there. Um, and this is just a little nice animation that I'll, I'll run you through because it shows you a little bit of the structural mapping, but also it leads to what is to come. So this is in Queensland, as you can see. And um, there are some sink lines features throughout there. So when we add our interpretation, you can probably map some of those um, parasitic folds. Um, then again, you can start doing all these sorts of measures and see how what the different stress levels and where they're coming from. Um, and again, I'm going to fade out a little. And that's what the sections look like. So on individual sections, then you can really construct a more data-driven geological story like we have there. So what is on the horizon? Apart from some really nice sand dunes that you can see there. Um, this is where we're going in the next few um, in the next few months. We're flying the eastern part of Queensland. It's a big chunk and that's going to have the team quite busy for the next little bit. Um, I've got a feel good video that I'd like to play. Yeah. Do you want to come up and, and, and it's just one minute. So I think you, you, you'll listen to my invited speaker who has a much nicer voice than me. So. Oh, the ground it has a small negative charge. The higher up the plant you go, the greater the electric charge. This creates an electric field around the flower. We can't see it, but these electrodes are picking up the energy of this tiny field and converting it into the sound that we can hear. Bees, on the other hand, have a positive charge. Friction whilst flying causes them to lose electrons. As a bee approaches a flower, the charge fields around the flower and the bee interact and the sound changes. There. And when it lands, the positive and negative fields immediately cancel each other out. As this happens, there are two very surprising consequences. Firstly, the plant's negatively charged pollen actually jumps across onto the positively charged bee. Secondly, the plant has a changed electrical field. And when another bee comes along, it detects this altered electrical signature and avoids the flower. The plant is in effect telling the bee that it has no nectar and to come back later. Okay, I hope you like that. <laughs> we'll go there. And I guess um, that, that's all, Marina. <laughs> that's, that's